Life is quite extraordinary and you are very welcome to this question and answer session about the Putin regime, Russian culture. All the questions come from Patreon today. None of the answers are going to be definitive, but I hope they're going to be of value and stimulate. And Bob, you've got a couple of quick fire questions first. Very welcome to this question and answer session. Vlad, does Putinism survive Putin? In the sense of Putin's sort of mystical fantasies about Russia's civilizational course, broadly speaking, no. In the sense of this conflict on the ex-Soviet space between the forces that stand for the democratic modern republic and the forces that stand for authoritarian empire, yes. It, it will, and that war will carry on going after Putin. What effects do you estimate the Russian military defeat to have on Russian identity? Putin can't afford to lose this war badly. So insofar as we're talking about the institution of presidency as incarnated by Putin, the only legitimate institution in Russia, which of course isn't legitimate, I mean, it has perceived legitimacy. And as far as that's concerned, then losing the war is quite a radical transformation, losing the war badly. But in terms of Russia's sort of wash of historical sort of self-conception, there is a story which says that we have a glorious defeat and then come back from it. And if there were a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO, then that could be a particularly glorious defeat for Russia, as long as it didn't escalate to full-scale nuclear war. And then there could be some myth about bouncing back from that. And that myth might be dramatized if the forces in power aren't the modern democratic republic forces, but the forces of authoritarianism and empire. Is there potential for a 1905 revolution in Russia, 1905. So, well, 05 was, of course, a reform movement, really, a reform march. Um, so, everything is possible in Russia at the moment because the situation is so extreme. But for a revolution to be the thing that tilts the regime, the regime would need to be in a bad wobble earlier than it sort of self expires. In other words, it's possible the regime simply reaches a stage where it ceases to work, signals are sent and nothing happens and you don't need a revolution. But if the regime significantly wobbles while still retaining some potency, then a revolution is possible. But what I would add is that whatever your thoughts are as an outsider about the potential for protest in Russia, think of it as being perhaps a bit lower than what you guess it to be. At least that's the correct way, um, you know, to, to, to tilt your uh, presumptions because there's um, very, very limited capacity at the moment for that country to produce large-scale protests. That could change, but that's where we are at the moment. Hope that kind of answers you a bit, Bob. What do you think of Elon Musk and his proposal on Twitter for a peace deal that involves redoing the um, voting under UN supervision in the annexed regions? Crimea stays Russian. Water supply to Crimea is assured Ukraine remains neutral. Let me say a little bit about Musk and a bit about that proposal of his specifically. Or not the proposal, but Musk making it. I think I'm positively inclined toward Musk and I feel protective of him. His dream of moving human life beyond Earth, and a lot of men who are part of this community who are big Musk fans will, will feel a bit bitter about what I'm about to say. Musk's dream will be refuted by history. It will be smashed by this century and by the century after this one. There are some utopias that you can see ahead will have that fate. And the 20th century killed some utopias. The utopia that the next 100 and 150 
years will kill, among others, will be the utopia of Elon Musk. And we can talk about that more another time. The other thing I would say about Elon is his neurodiversity is really important um, in being an explainer um, of much of the way he conducts himself. So this whole story about Musk's eccentric genius is largely nonsense. When Musk goes on Joe Rogan's show and spends, you know, 70 seconds answering in, you know, in silence before he answers an elementary question, people think, well, what an extraordinarily uh, deep thinking genius. Musk is, and Ma Musk is utterly brilliant, but he's not unable to speak because of that. He's unable to speak because he's autistic. So it's very difficult for him to operate with language in a social situation. He's got words inside him, but he can't quite get them out. That's a very common experience for folks with his neurodiversity. And it's a real, real struggle, and it's really terribly painful for him. And you feel if you if you know people um, with that condition, you can feel it straight away. And so I feel enormously empathetic with how much he struggles and people just say complete nonsense about how that's his eccentricity of genius. And the same goes with his physical handling as well. I mean, you see him walk out of a car and head toward the door and be assailed by journalists asking him questions and he's cut, caught in between completely. He doesn't know whether to speak or to walk where to turn, uh, 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 uh. and all of this is impossible for him to regulate, whereas for a neurotypical person, it's completely easy to regulate these situations. So um, Musk is way less weird than he looks, if only one understands neurodiversity. Now, in terms of his specific proposal, look, I think it's part of Musk's brand that he gets himself on the action on the key issues in the world. So that's one thing that's going on. The second thing that's going on is the kind of overreach that brilliant people experience and then realize that their judgment dries up when it comes to other questions. And then the third element there is genuinely fear and concern about World War III, uh, fear and concern about nuclear war. A lot of people who believe, in my view, wrongly that Ukraine should give away a great deal of land and we should make compromises with Putin a lot of people who wrongly believe that are rightly very worried about the nuclear risk and, and they connect the need to compromise with the need to minimize nuclear risk. That's some of my thoughts about Musk. David asks, all the citizens are slaves, that's a hypothesis, um, and Putin can do what he likes with them. And so for any uprising to occur, it would need to be a kind of a slave revolt, which is a rare thing in history. How is this thought? How is this analogy? Um, sometimes when we have a thought, it can strike us that it's very compelling, while the truth might be that it's actually neither right nor wrong because it's insufficiently filled out. It's too vague and vacuous. And I think the idea of Russians having a surf mentality isn't so much a wrong claim, it's a vacuous claim. In other words, when people say it, they don't actually know what they mean. They think they know, but their um, utterance would not survive three or four interrogative questions. So it's important to recognize that. That doesn't mean there can't be any substance to going in that direction, but it means that you've got to go in that direction specifically, more specifically than just saying surf slave mentality. So let's put a couple of very simple markers on the table and then we can pick up the conversation another time. Um, the first marker is, can you even say anything in a direction like that about another culture? Because surely all cultures are equal and surely all cultures are equally good at everything in principle, right? Wrong. Um, it's very important to take seriously the thought that any culture that's sustained over a very long period of time probably has a great deal to teach us and probably contains some particular features of cultural life, but also some universal features of human life that are expressed in a particularly unique and interesting way. 
that's um, enriching or distinctive. And so really, um, just assign depth to a culture that's been sustained over a long time and then explore what it is. So what that depth's going to be, what's going to be remarkable about that culture is going to be contingent. It's very important that cultures are better and worse than one another in different respects. Yeah? So this idea that all cultures are equal in all respects is um, not even wrong. Again, it's an idea that is an evasive substitute. In other words, it's an idea that pre pretends to be a kind of judgment. But in fact, it's a egalitarian and self-congratulatory evasion of judgment. So absolutely, uh, we can talk about cultures being better and worse than one another in certain respects. And it's precisely because different cultures are better and worse than you know, the other in different respects that we can take seriously the thought that all cultures have something remarkable to offer. So therefore, we can comfortably say that you know, Tongan culture is relatively unimpressive when it comes to music or gastronomy. But it's particularly impressive when it comes to family bonds, you know, so better, worse, in different respects. These judgments um, are absolutely available. In fact, they're necessary. Without them, um, you could never defend cultures that are in a racist or colonial way dismissed. You can only defend culture, a uh, particular culture, by looking at what is its distinctive contribution, and it will have one if it sustained itself over a long period of time. So that means that a specific version of the thought Russians have a slave mentality could be available, but that general utterance, there's some kind of a slave mentality going on, isn't going to get us anywhere. So that's the first marker. And the second marker is the, the bit about getting more specific. Let's try to do that just for a few seconds. You could obviously make some kind of biological claim, which I'd, I'd advise you not to. And then there are at least two more categories of claim you can make. You can't just make a psychological claim, right? Because that would be conflating tens of millions of people living under culture with the mind of a single individual. There's going to be a, a problem stretching that analogy um, meaningfully. But there are going to be two levels of explanation that you'd be concerned about. One is what I would call sociological explanation. And that would be explanation to do with processes of modernization, explanation to do with processes of power relations, explanation to do with processes of secularization, urbanization, you get the point. That's one kind of story. And if the surf mentality stuff is stuff you want to establish by that kind of conversation, you're going to have a problem um, saying that there's something distinctively Russian about this mentality you're trying to point out. Because all you're going to establish by these sociological means is that particular socioeconomic conditions generate particular consequences, right, in human beings that find themselves ensconced in these conditions. It doesn't matter whether they're Belgian or Russian. But you might say, well, it is Russian, this quality, insofar as it is Russians who have undergone these sociological conditions. And even though anybody would be shaped by these conditions like Russians are, Russians have been shaped by them uh, in particular because they've experienced them in, in, in a distinct way or with greater intensity and so on. The other camp here, the other sort of thread you might uh, draw out, would be what I would call historical explanation, which is really um, soci sociological, uh, psychological explanation as appropriate to culture. And here you might talk about something that's less about power relations, modernization. You might talk about um, certain ways of looking at the world, certain ways of being in the world that obtain 
in virtue of particular language use, of particular social practices that are contingent to, 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 a, to a certain culture. Now, if all I'm doing is just putting these two things on the table as two modes of explanation with which you need to fill out this idea that Russians may or may not have some kind of a surf mentality, um, could I add anything else? Yeah, I don't use this surf mentality expression, partly because it's just got a kind of a, a, a common currency of evasion. Everybody who says it actually has no idea what they mean by it. So therefore, I would say what you would discover if you ran these two explanatory stories far enough is that there are certain, and I would say um, culturally particular problems with fatalism and certain kinds of fatalism in that culture. And about that, we have to talk another time. Aga asks, who is worse as president, Putin or Trump, if Trump is re-elected for democracy in general and for people of their respective countries? So Aga, this is not going to be an individual conversation once you ask that question. It's going to be a conversation about institutions. Because any Western politician, so long as we're talking about a Western country with sufficiently functional institutions, is going to be contained by them. So think about Vladimir Putin not being elected to the office of president in Russia, but becoming a member of parliament in the UK. And imagine Putin being a front bench MP, a cabinet member, a shadow cabinet member, then a back bench MP over the course of a couple of decades. Putin would be sufficiently constrained by these institutions that his positions would be, quite frankly, the positions of mainstream British politics. No. His personality would come out in a certain way, so he would lean right, he would lean hawkish, he would lean nationalistic, but he would be constrained. So this isn't a conversation about individuals. It's a conversation about institutions. That's going to be the central difference between any Western politician and Vladimir Putin. Would a lot of Western politicians drift in a, in a terrifying way if they were placed in the kind of position Putin was placed? Yeah, they would. Absolutely. I mean, being at the top of a kind of malleable, quasi-mafia-like autocracy isn't going to be good for anybody. And anybody, after a few years in that kind of position, would be up to all kinds of crazy stuff. Hopefully they wouldn't start a catastrophic war like Putin did, but they'll be up to crazy stuff. Now, um, we're going to talk about Western politicians specifically, but one of the questions about them is, are they politicians we either like or don't like, think do good or do harm? Or are they politicians that somehow go beyond that and become parasitic upon democratic procedure and democratic ritual? It's important to draw that distinction and place a, a politician uh, on, on the right side. You don't want to say that a politician who you simply disagree with is a politician who is sort of toxically anti-democratic. Equally, you don't want to say that a toxically democratic politician is just a politician you, you disagree with. And we're going to talk about how to call this out and how to categorize this, how to identify this. Then there's another problem to be um, thought about. And that's that if we are looking at a general trend of um, democratic decline, then there will be scenarios where no matter who gets into office will leave office with democracy being weaker. Um, and we're going to talk about how, if at all, and maybe in what countries that could be reversed. That could be some dynamics of economic, of democratic regeneration, not just democratic degeneration. But I would say that this is a painful conversation which would re will require a lot of hope but also a lot of kind of pessimism of strength where we um, recognize that being pessimistic is right that that's not the end of the world and that we can keep making you know 
a good go at making the world a better place. So th these, this is some of the scaffolding for that kind of conversation. I, I hope that helps a tiny bit. HS asks, would you be willing to delineate your perspective on the influence of intergenerational trauma on Russian society and the current escalation? Briefly, no, because it's just too big a conversation. So let me just touch on one thing and I'll do it sort of temperamentally. It could be another thing if I was answering the question just you know, an hour later. Of course, you've got to be aware that we're talking about a context in which the, you know, the country went through the Bolshevik Revolution of 1970, which really is like ISIS taking the country over. It's a very, very, very extreme experience that traumatized folks in that country. And then um, as the Soviet Union broke up, the bits that broke off from Russia, on the whole, did a better job processing the uh, trauma. But the nugget that I would put on the table just on this occasion is that there is a certain sense in which the Soviet Union felt out of time. And there is a sense in which Russians today feel out of time. They don't know where they are in history. Um, they can't sort of approach that line and say, this is kind of where we are and where we've come from and where we might go. And so because of this extraordinary sense of broken time and this is not alexander dugan broken time we're not talking about anything ontological we're just talking about an historical sense uh so we, no, nothing nothing metaphysical here nothing complexly phenomenological we're just talking about people feeling sort of like they are in a kind of no man's no woman's land in terms of where they are located in history yeah. so I'm going to leave this deliberately vague, but this is quite an important thought I'm going to have to explore. Um, at the end of the Soviet Union, you also felt that the Soviet Union was out of time. You didn't know um, whether you would ever be sort of reconnected with, the, with the, the, the traffic that was the rest of the world, or whether you would always be in this sort of bubble. It felt like it could never end. But it had to end. It felt like it had been there for a short time, but also forever. It was this sort of real, real strange sense of historical dislocation. And now it's um, even greater for Russians after the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, probably this is the vaguest thing I've ever said, but I promise to say more about it. Another anonymous question. How do you develop your views on nuclear risk as a non-military expert? Well, that's easy. There are three kinds of view that are amateurish for me, that are views that I sort of want to be left to experts that I don't get involved with. First kind of view is just an empirical view. That might be um, views about who has what weapons and what they can do. Second kind of view is an evaluative view. And that's not a view about what should or shouldn't happen, nor is it a view about facts. It's a view about reality that requires interpretation. So, for instance, what's in the minds of people who might be involved in the nuclear chain in Russia? Again, I leave that to experts. And then the third kind of view is a normative view. So what should the West, what should the United States do if Russia uses a nuclear weapon? And that, again, I leave to experts. What I have professional views about is, for instance, something like this conversation about the apocalyptic nature of the way Putin thinks about nuclear weapons. I will talk about that properly, but um, very roughly speaking, we can put it like this. There are suicide bombers. That's it. That's the thought. So let's expand it a bit. Your conception of how imperative it is to avoid your death and the destruction of civilization is potentially more different than you think from that of other people. 
So quite certainly Mr. Putin doesn't want World War Three. But he may be in a certain way more open to it by let's let's be optimistic here, let's say by twelve percent. Just by a little sliver. It's more than that, but it's it's also not an enormous amount. He doesn't he doesn't want the end of the world. But he is more open to it than any Western politician I can think of, because of certain kind of apocalyptic civilizational tendencies about clearing the chessboard, and that comes out with his endless remark about what point there is in the world existing if Russia isn't in it. So that's an example of a professional view I have about nuclear risk that just doesn't legislate at all on these first three. Aaron is next, and Aaron asks, why are so many people drawn to authoritarian leadership and don't recognize that living in a democracy is the right thing? Possible explanations I know of are underdog supporting, belief in conspiracy theories and the psychological concept of the authoritarian personality. So Aaron, I don't think you can explain things like that fundamentally by referencing universal features of human psychology. Um, because then you can have a problem with explaining why people are skeptical about democracy today, but they weren't skeptical in the same way in 1992, right? So that stuff about human beings being inclined in certain ways, um, no, it's going to have to be more particular than that. So yes, there are certain human capabilities and dispositions, but why they're being expressed in a certain way at a particular time. Right? And the particular conversation I think we've got to have today isn't about how people are drawn to charismatic leaders or don't understand the value of procedure because it's boring or something else. What we really have to understand is that there's a crisis of trust that's going on. And that explanation is none of the things you mentioned. That explanation is partly economic, to do with folks having a tough time and having a tough time for a long time. It's partly to do with conditions of the modern world, certain kinds of alienation. And it's to do with policy. It's to do with policy and the way policy allowed politics to drift away from ordinary folks. I'm being cartoonish, but you see this is already beginning to sound like a set of doorways into explanation, right? The, oh, people are drawn to this and that. That's never, that's never going to explain anything. Um, so, you know, we've got this crisis of trust. Um, I would date it in terms of its acceleration to the middle tens in terms of its inception, the early 1970s. And I want to talk and maybe even do some longer lectures about what are these mechanisms of democratic decline and also how we can reverse them. But, but the key tip here is don't just refer to general tendencies of humans. They, they ain't gonna explain much because you always then have the problem of uh, uh, making sense of why people weren't skeptical of democracy um, you know, 30 years ago the way they are today. Ryan asks, if Russia loses the war and if the sanctions remain in place, will the international community use these sanctions as a stick to enact change in Russia? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that Russia cannot hold the world hostage like now. Russia cannot make hundreds of millions of people uncomfortable about their safety and feel threatened by a nuclear war. That is unacceptable. And if the United States is in a position to put Russia in a position where it can't threaten us like that, um, then that will be done. It's not even a question of evaluating whether it should be done. It just um, will be an aspiration for the United States because this, this situation is unacceptable. Now, I would say that tendentiously, the specific steps that Russia may take on a very good outcome toward being something like a modern democratic republic, if it survives as a relatively intact state, 
well, these steps need to be done inside. And when they are imposed externally into teacherly way, they don't hold and often create, um, you know, resistance um, and dissolution and resentment. Anonymous asks, how do you decide who to engage with and does engagement uh, mean that you are asking us to trust the person you are engaging with? And then I want to pair that with a question from Ella, which is, what do I think of a particular talk by Jeffrey Sachs, which I've um, listened to in full, Ella? So let me link these two questions. Um, I haven't talked to many people, so the question hasn't really arisen. But in principle, just the fact that I'm talking to somebody doesn't mean that I think that they are more right than wrong about things. It doesn't mean that they're a good faith actor. I don't believe in talking to just good faith actors because the good faith, bad faith distinction is actually unavailable. Um, most people are a bit screwed up, unfortunately. So if one just spoke to people who are really, 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 really together, one would speak to virtually nobody. <laughs> so that's not it. Obviously, there are limits. You know, obviously, there are people one wouldn't speak to and there are things one wouldn't speak to with certain people. Sure. But um, no, just because I'm speaking with somebody um, doesn't mean that I'm asking you to endorse their views and does not mean I'm asking you or recommending you to trust them. Um, but if I'm speaking with somebody, um, I will normally imply a kind of commentary about where you should stand on, on these questions. I won't leave you alone with that. I won't leave it ambiguous to you. Um, also because I'm very good at being extremely blunt with people directly. So I just tell somebody, you know, great to be talking with you. I don't trust you in this and that way. Um, so what's the broader lesson here? The broader lesson here is that for most people watching this, not for all, but for most people watching it, your conception of that circle of permissible conversation, permissible engagement is too narrow. There's nothing illegal about that, but if you want to be a constructive citizen, then that's a bad idea to have that circle too narrow. Um, because what you're doing is you're essentially omitting the majority of the discourse that percolates in your culture. A lot of it is ugly. A lot of it is a bit toxic, but um, it's, it's got to be in the circle of an engaged citizen. And there's a very dangerous habit in the world today to try to aspirationally constrain the circle. But you constrain the circle aspirationally, but the culture still retains that kind of shape. You can sort of gesture this all you like, but the culture retains that shape, it has that breadth. So it's really important not to lose this perspective, we'll be talking about this. Now, Ella, Jeffrey Sachs, for me, in that interview, is a very, very powerful um, opponent of my position. Much more compelling and impressive in policy views than Noam Chomsky, and certainly than John Mearsheimer. John Mearsheimer has such low quality resolution that ironically, I think that he can't even articulate the NATO factor properly, because to articulate the NATO factor properly, you need to ask questions like, well, which people in the Kremlin over years have been agitated and to what extent about NATO expansion, right? And I don't think John Mearsheimer can say that because he operates at an altitude of 3,000 feet. He can't even settle these questions. He can't even settle um, the exact landscape of the uh, issues that um, NATO expansion brought up. So, um, for me, Ella, Jeffrey, who is impressive, I haven't spoken to him, people close to me have spoken to him, all very impressed. Um, Jeffrey completely misunderstands this war, misunderstands the aspirations of the Russian regime and misunderstands the kind of security threat the regime poses to us and misunderstands um, the problems with trying to negotiate with Putin now.
and make concessions to him. So, but Jeffrey is a very worthy opponent. And so I'm strongly advising you to take views like his, and they are more robust, articulate than Mearsheimer's, and say, oh, maybe I disagree with him very strongly, but he's absolutely inside that circle. I mean, really, really inside that circle. Um, the idea that you might want to put somebody like Jeffrey Sachs on a list of people who you think are sort of toxic commentators we shouldn't listen to is profoundly damaging, profoundly immature, self-indulgent, and is an expression of um, a completely self-defeating strategy of engagement or disengagement in this case. In other words, none of your own goals, none of your own aspirations about having a conversation in your culture um, that um, is, you know, healthy and has certain kind of qualities to it and is ethically sound. Um, none of your aspirations in that direction can be met by ex excluding people who fundamentally disagree with you on the Ukraine war. Um, so respect these people and respect Mearsheimer too. Uh, Mearsheimer is I think not just wrong, but kind of frivolous in his view, because it has such little friction with on the ground facts. It happens at an altitude of 30,000 feet. But he is not a purveyor of fake news. He doesn't go around completely making stuff up. Um, he arrives at a profoundly misguided opinion, and um, he is never to be put on any kind of list of toxic characters we must not engage with. Speaking of conversations of a different kind, where there's a, a considerable deal of agreement, um, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, check out my conversation with Jake uh, on his channel um, about everything to do with this war and where it's up to. Thank you so, so much for your attention. Lots of love. Talk soon.